Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's 3.15, so I suggest we start with the final session in this conference. Um, so there's two papers lined up. Uh, this, this session is dealing with the macroeconomic effects of fiscal policy in advanced economies. And the first paper will be presented by Gernot Müller. And he has quite a number of co-authors there, actually. Lydia Cox, Ernesto Passen, Raphael Schönle, and Michel Weber. And the topic is about big G. I understand it's going to get quite granular on terms of uh, it's big G, but uh, you know, going quite deeply into the numbers. Um, you will have 30 minutes for the presentation. And uh, Henning Weber uh, will have 15 minutes for um, acting as discussant. Just as a housekeeping before we uh, kick off the presentation itself, and as a reminder, um, anybody who has questions or comments to raise, which uh, we will allow to take in the Q&A round, can put them in the chat. Um, and those who are panelists can also raise their hands and, and then actually ask the question. So um, with this, I, I pass the floor to Gernot from the University of Tübingen. This is for putting the paper on the program. It was very uh, inspiring conference thus far, this far. So as Isabel said, this is joint work with Lydia Cox and as to pass and Raphael Schönle and Michael Weber and it's about uh, Big G. So what is Big G? Well, if you take a traditional perspective in economics, say, uh, on government spending, we, we start from national accounting in Macro 101 and we write Y equals C plus I plus G. Yeah? And if you take this perspective, then we think of G essentially as a homogeneous good, essentially a fraction of GDP, which is we think uh, determined by a policymaker, say in response to the business cycle, he or she changes G, and then we summarize the effect of these changes in G by a single fiscal multiplier. Okay. Now, in this paper, as Isabel already uh, alluded to, we try to uh, challenge this view a little bit and provide a new perspective, which is based both on data and some theory. Yeah. In the first part of the paper, we analyze microdata and perform, you know, something which we could call somewhat pompously perhaps an autonomy of big G. And we establish here, based on this microdata, that government spending is heterogeneous. Big surprise, you may say, uh, this uh, you suspected all along. So to put some more structure onto this, we try to establish five uh, concrete facts. And then we take these facts and take the simplest possible model and um, map these facts into this model in order to understand how accounting for those facts changes our view on the fiscal transmission mechanism. That's the paper, okay? So the five facts are as follows. First, uh, government spending is granular. And here we simply mean the fact that government spending is concentrated among a few firms and sectors. This is not surprising, but the extent to which we document this in data, we believe is, is, is quite uh, stunning. Second, there's sectoral bias in the sense that the composition of government spending uh, differs from the composition of spending which we observe in the private sector, that is in the rest of the economy. Third, government spending is moderately persistent in the sense that the contracts on which government spending is based is relatively short. Also, if we estimate processes for government spending, we find relatively a moderate decrease of persistence. Fourth, if we look at the aggregate variation in government spending, we can relate it to idiosyncratic variation, both at the firm and at the sector level. So we are working away from this saying, stressing that it's really the idiosyncratic shocks shocks at the firm or sectoral level, which drive aggregate variation over time. So this invites a bottom up perspective rather than a top down perspective when it comes to understanding the determinants of government spending. Last, across sectors, there are heterogeneous pricing frictions and we observe that uh, quite uh, pronounced government spending is concentrated in these in those sectors where uh, price stickiness is pervasive and this plays out big time in terms of our theoretical account our theoretical account is based on a on the simplest possible model um so the the only innovation we do to this model is that we allow for two sectors yeah still within this simple model we are able to account for all the five facts which we establish in the data 
In the first step, we take the model to do some analytical results, so theory, if you want. And here we show that multipliers can be infinitely negative if you increase government spending in the sector where prices are relatively flexible. Yeah? This is a new result to the extent that in the one sector, new Keynesian benchmark model, the multiplier is never negative. Okay, It can be negative in our setup. Also, somewhat counterintuitively, if we raise the overall stickiness, we find that the multiplier, depending on how you measure it, can decline even though price stickiness increase. Uh, this is theory results. Also at the zero lower bound, we see that the ranking of multipliers across sectors may flip. So in the last step um, of, the, um, of the analysis, we take the model and calibrate it to those five facts. And we find that the uh, impact multiplier of a shock that originates in the sticky sector is about four times larger as a shock that originates in the relatively flexible price sector. Also, the multiplier tends to be in the calibrated model uh, quite a bit larger than in a um, corresponding one sector model. And um, overall, the upshot is that the model, the calibrated model, behaves somewhat more Keynesian than the one sector benchmark in the sense that there is less intertemporal substitution in response to government spending and less crowding out, and therefore a larger multiplier. And um, and this is interesting in light of the theory, because as you are probably well aware, there's quite a bit of literature these days accounting for heterogeneity in the fiscal transmission mechanism, but this literature has focused on the household side, hang, tank, and whatnot. Yeah? And this important literature has emphasized that heterogeneity on the household side is important for fiscal policy transmission. Now, relative to this literature, we take, take a step back because we say, okay, wait a minute, this is all important household heterogeneity, but government spending itself is heterogene heterogeneous, and that too matters for the fiscal transmission mechanism. Okay, so um, but let me let me skip the other literature and just go go right to the empirical analysis. I just wonder about my connection, but it's okay. Yeah, you hear me well still. Please, I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Your video is just uh, temporary. Uh, okay. I don't know, it's not so important, I guess, what's going on here. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah, you tell me once you uh, can't hear me anymore. Uh, so, um, our database is this uh, website, USA Gov uh, Spending Gov, which has been set up in response to, a, to a accountability and trans transparency law legislated in 2006, but then the data was backdated, so we have now a time series um, from uh, 2001 to 2018, 18 years of data, and this basically spans the entire universe of government contracts. Uh, a large chunk of this, but by far not everything, is contracts uh, awarded by the Department of Defense, about half of them and two-thirds by value, but we also have lots of contracts which are not defense, uh, which is not defense spending. In total, we have uh, 57 million observations, uh, we have 160,000 recipient uh, companies and so forth. For each contract, we see the, um, the government agency, which is awarding this contract, and the recipient firm. We complement these data. So this is federal spending. Yeah? We complement this uh, data uh, by, uh, with data from the BAA in order to also see whether, to what extent our facts uh, hold up at the state and local level. And for some of the facts we establish, we can, we can show this. Um, and uh, last, we complement our data with the BLS data on uh, price uh, adjustments in order to establish how much price utilities in those sectors is where government spending is primarily active. So here's a bird's eye view on, on what we are talking about. Again, big G in the standard macro model would be uh, government consumption expenditure and cross investment to give you some number. Of course, last year in the US, uh, that was some 4,000 billions in, uh, and uh, when GDP was uh, somewhat uh, more than uh, 20,000 billion. So roughly speaking, we are looking at uh, close to 20% of GDP. Yeah, this is partly federal, partly state and local. Our contract data covers what is indicated with these red boxes. Uh, this is roughly speaking 40% of the federal spending and so 16% of overall spending 
if we complement this with data from uh, the BAA for um, state and local spending, we have some additional data on intermediate inputs there. So altogether, we end up talking about 40% of, of BG. What do we miss? In terms of federal expenditure, we miss the R&D spending, which comes mostly in grants. So this is not contracts data included in the, in the database. And then also in terms of government accounting, we think of government consumption expenditure in terms of a production function, which uses intermediate goods for which we have data, but we don't have data for the value added, which is to a large extent compensation of employees. In other words, we do not have data on government wages, yeah, which in the standard macro model would be part of Big G. Okay. So with this, let me go to the first fact, and that's the granularity of government spending. Yeah? And here we simply mean that government spending is concentrated uh, among a few firms and sectors. This holds for defense and non-spending, as well as for um, um, state and local spending. There are different ways of establishing granularity, but I mean, the simplest possible way is maybe just to show this chart here. So here you see, for all the contracts in our database, the concentration uh, among firms or sectors. So in the left panel, you see over time, that's a very robust pattern over time, you see, let's let's focus on the, 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 the darkest blue line, which hovers around at 80%, and that's the top 1% of firms, they receive about 80% of the contract. So that's a very high degree of concentration. The top 1% of all firms receive 80% of contracts. Uh, if you turn to sectoral breakdown, the six digit uh, uh, breakdown would amount to a, a, about a thousand sectors. And if you look at the top 10, so 100, the top 100 sectors in the middle panel, they would also account for roughly 80% of, of, of government spending over time. Uh, and if you turn to the very right panel, you look at the breakdown in the, in the two digit um, sector classification and here the most solid line gives you the top five out of some 25 sectors so here the top five sectors receive 80 percent of of government spending in that sense very straightforward across firms and sectors we observe a high concentration of government spending in those sectors okay another way to establish this granularity following abex would be to look at the distribution of contracts yeah in the data and benchmark this against a uh, theoretical distribution. And here we take the log normal distribution, which has fat tails. Thus, it is indicative of a certain concentration of contracts. And uh, you see that here in these QQ plots, we plot the actual quantiles along the vertical axis, and we plot this against the theoretical quantiles on the, on the horizontal axis. If the uh, actual distribution uh, aligns well with the log normal, which is simulated assuming the same mean and variance as we have in the data, you see that uh, that will tell you that the log normal distribution approximate the actual distribution quite well. And you see that this is uh, the case at the transaction level, at the firm level, at the sector level. So we walk away from this first fact, just stressing that there's a lot of granularity, yeah? either in, in the sense that it's concentrated among firms, and, um, very few firms and sectors, or if you prefer this measure, that there is a fat distribution. Second fact, sectoral bias. Here we simply mean that the composition of government spending across sectors differs from the allocation of private spending across sectors. And one way to put this down formally is that simple equation here where GK would be the share of spending going to sector K relative to overall spending and that, to the extent that there is sectoral bias, differs from the share of that sector in GDP. Graphically, we have two way, two breakdowns here to, to make this point. In the left panel, you see a breakdown according to federal spending. That would be the red dots. And here we measure against the vertical axis the share of government spending in a particular sector against the horizontal axis, which gives you the share of that sector in GDP. And to the extent that these dots do not uh, sit on the 45 degree line, that is indicative of the sectoral bias. And that, that happens basically for almost all sectors. 
Similarly, in the right panel, we break up the data into defense and non-defense spending, and a very similar picture emerges in the sense that uh, there's a big bias. Yeah? Uh, to make things a little bit more concrete here, I give you a table with the two sector, uh, two digit sector classification, and it's ordered in such a way that the top three sectors in terms of government spending come up on top and you see that together they amount to some 70 percent of spending manufacturing being the largest sector the second largest is professional scientific and technical services uh, and the, the third one is administrative and waste management so these three sectors while accounting for 70 percent of government spending account only for some 18 percent of of gdp you know if you want a sector which is big in terms of gdp but uh, small in terms of government spending, there will be healthcare, social assistance, okay? Fact three is moderate persistence. Here we look at the duration of contracts, and we also look at the duration of firms in our sample. Remember, we have 18 years of data, and we can uh, look how long certain firms are in, in the data set. And here, I should uh, stress that this data is very comprehensive. All contracts be above $25,000 have to be recorded in the database. So if a firm drops out of our sample, we know it's basically not catering to the government. Yeah. The, the contract duration median is only 31 days. Here I have a nice example. Let me tell you my example. So that's just uh, an arbitrary contract from September 2008 when Sykes Property and Appraisal Services were awarded a contract for single family housing appraisals. So this is a job which can be done in, in a few couple of days. And then at the opposite um, end of the spectrum, we have a contract. The longest lasting contract in our sample is a 40 year and 10 month contract awarded to by the Department of Energy to Stanford University for the operation and management of the SALC National Accelerator uh, Lab. OK, so that's 43. That, that's the exception, of course. Yeah, you see that there are a few longer lasting contracts. The mean is 123 days. Here in the left panel, I give you the distribution, the cumulative distribution function of the contract. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, you see the duration in days and the dashed line marks 365 days. So there will be contracts to the left of this which last less than a year. And that's clearly the majority of contracts. That's the dark line. In the lighter line is uh, the multi-transaction contracts, which naturally last longer, but even also here, the, major, the large majority of contracts is, has fairly short durations. Now in the right panel, I was talking about this already, you see the share of firms which uh, stay in the uh, uh, data set for a number of years. So the large majority of firms stay only one year, uh, meaning they are no longer catering to the government. And then only amongst the most important firms, or let's let's look at the um, the top 10% of firms. There will be the blue line with circles. You see only a small fraction, say 5% of those firms stay in the in the sample for the entire period for 18 years. Okay, so another way to to establish persistence as we do it in in standard macro analysis would be to estimate an AR1 process. We do so at the sectoral level using the two-digit classification. And we end up with parameters around 0.4 or the entire range is between 0.2 and 0.67, which is somewhat smaller than what we have in the data. This is not entirely irrelevant to the extent that this persistence, if you take a neoclassical perspective, governs the wealth effect of government spending shock, so to speak. Okay, fourth fact, idiosyncratic shocks dominate when it comes to accounting for the variation in the aggregate spending. In the in the short uh, run, yeah. How do we see this? Well, we do estimate, as I said, AR1 processes on uh, on at the sectoral level in a panel, and we include time fixed effects to see whether there's a common component. Yeah. Once we do this, the R square increases from 97.9 to 98.3 percent. So it, there is no common component. In other words, there's no um, aggregate component yeah also if we look at the idiosyncratic innovations to this shock process we don't see a systematic pattern so some shocks are positive some innovations are positively correlated others are negatively correlated so it is really this 
bottom up thing, you know, which which we observe here in the data. Another way to establish this following up X would be to compute the granular residual. This is what we do here with the gamma term. Here we look at the deviation of spending growth in one firm I or one sector I relative to the firm or sector average weighted with that uh, with that uh, sectors of firm share in the previous period to see whether in some sectors of firms there's important variation relative to what's going on in the in the in the in the average yeah and whether that granular residual can then account uh, for overall changes in, in in government spending we do this following up x for firms and sectors separately in those columns including lags or not including lags either way we get a fairly high r squared that's in the very bottom line you see r squares between 0.3 and 0.39 suggesting that this granular residual is indeed accounting for aggregate uh, fluctuations yeah? so idiosyncratic fluctuations uh, move this big g around rather than you know having an accurate movement in g uh, shifting uh, these, uh, these these things at the at the micro level last fact last fact when we look at the price stickiness across sectors and here again we use the two sector classification we observe that government spending is concentrated in sectors where price stickiness is pervasive in the left panel you see the two blue balls and are against the horizontal axis you see the share of those sectors in spending this is close to uh, 30 percent and uh, on the vertical axis we measure the frequency of price changes which is about uh, 10 percent this is at monthly frequency so in those sectors only some 10 percent of firms do change their price in a given month uh, and uh, that's different from the other sectors where um, where about 22 percent of firms change their prices we robustify this finding by looking at the inverse of the contract duration as a proxy for um, the uh, stickiness and here we, we uh, obtain a very similar picture okay that fact will turn out to be important when we uh, turn to theory which is what i do now okay so the question is uh, to what extent does this heterogeneity matter? Yeah, and to address this question, we start from the basic textbook version of the New Keynesian model: monopolistically competitive environment, carbon pricing. There's a representative household which allocates consumption over time. Monetary policy targets inflation. That's kind of important to keep things transparent. We don't assume a tailor rule. We say really monetary policy goes for stabilizing prices completely. Yeah, there's zero inflation. And this makes things very straightforward. We say that government spending is financed through lump sum taxes as usual, and the only innovation relative to the workhorse model is now that we say we have two sectors rather than one. Yeah? And those sectors differ in their steady state shares in government spending. So gamma would be the weight of spending that goes to uh, sector one. Omega would be the weight of private spending that goes to sector one. And then you have the share of private spending in output, that's the letter CEDA, so that endogenously we determine the size of sector 1N as a weighted average of those shares going, uh, of the private and the public shares going to that sector. Importantly, the sectors also differ in terms of price rigidity, so alpha would be the Calvo parameter, and that's different in the two sectors. Okay. Now, the model is super standard. Let me skip the algebraic exposition and, and tell, tell you what we do with the model. So we approximate the model as usual around a deterministic steady state linearized. Uh, now, the steady state is asymmetric in the sense that we have this sectoral bias. Yeah? Uh, I will be more specific about how we map the five facts into the model when we turn to the calibration. For now, the important assumption is that Prices are completely flexible in sector one, while they are sticky in sector two. And this is very stylized and makes it easy to get closed form results. Yeah? So what's also important, we have spending at the sector level. So we have shocks taking place in sector one and sector two. This is very stylized. I was stressing sec uh, um, fact four. Fact four is that it's really the idiosyncratic uh, shocks which dominate the overall fluctuations. Here in the simplest possible model, we could think of 
this boils down to assuming, okay, there's two sectors. In each sector, you have a shock rather than having an aggregate shock. Okay, now in this world, you have the terms of trade, the relative price of the two uh, sectors as an endogenous variable, and that's the only endo the endogenous variable. And so you can still solve this paper, uh, this model paper pencil. Yeah? And uh, then we, having solved for the terms of trade, we can then solve for consumption. And then we arrive at equation seven, which I find quite exciting. It gives you the solution of consumption as a function of the terms of trade tau from the previous period as an endogenous state. We can ignore this for now and focus on G1 and G2, which are spending shocks taking place in sector one and sector two respectively. Now these guys here are just scaling factors so that we are looking at shocks which are normalized to be equal to 1% of GDP. Yeah. What's exciting is the TEDA guys. The TEDA guys are measuring the impact of these spending shocks on consumption. And they are positive. They are positive. And here's a minus in front, meaning you always get grounding out of private uh, expenditures in response to these spending shocks. However, however, the TEDA 1 differs from the TEDA 2. G1, I should remind you, is sector 1 spending. And sector 1 differs from sector 2 in that prices are completely flexible, while prices are sticky in sector 2. Now, as a result, theta one can become arbitrarily large. It can be arbitrarily large, meaning you get lots of crowding out. And this is really the heart of the model, how changing, how accounting for the sectoral composition of spending is really changing the fiscal transmission mechanism. So what's going on? Think of an increase of government spending in sector one. This is inflationary. Monetary policy is sitting there preventing inflation to go up. So given this spending impulse, this inflationary spending impulse, it has to put hard on the brakes because since government spending is raised in sector one, where prices are very flexible, inflation is very responsive. So this means a lot of uh, counteracting action from the central bank, interest rates go up in order to reduce consumption because only by lowering aggregate demand, which is consumption in this model, uh, the central bank can prevent inflation from rising. Yeah. So um, maybe the, the easiest way is to, if you contrast this with theta 2, if spending goes up in the sticky sector, inflation is not very responsive and therefore monetary policy has not to react very much. Okay, So it's really in order to keep inflation in check that monetary policy brings about a, contr a contraction of consumption. But the important thing here for monetary policy is that it only has a very blunt instrument it can only steer consumption by adjusting uh, the policy rate and consumption falls on all sectors. So um, uh, it may, in response to higher spending in sector one, which is very inflationary, also has to bring down consumption in sector two, which buys very little in terms of reduced inflation because prices are very sticky in sector two. Now, these re responses for consumption map directly into output multipliers. Remember, theta one can be very large, and as a result, gamma, which would be a measure of the output multiplier, can be uh, negative. Yeah? And that's a new result to the extent that the one sector model only knows uh, non zero multipliers. Okay, let me spend the last bit of my, my presentation on, on how we calibrate this model to capture the five facts. There's a bunch of parameters which are the same in, as in a standard model. And then we have the five facts. And here we say, OK, sector two represents the top three sectors in terms of government spending for in which government spending, uh, which account for 70 percent of government spending. Then there's sectoral bias. So we say that that sector is relatively small, meaning that private spending falls largely on sector one, where prices are more flexible. We capture the persistence simply by estimating AR1 processes on data for the top three sectors and the remaining sectors. We end up with moderate values here. We account for fact four, namely that there's idiosyncratic shocks driving the aggregate variation over time by looking at sector specific shocks rather than at aggregate shocks. And lastly, we uh, calibrate this model to capture the degree of price stickiness, which we do find in the BLS data for those sectors. So sector two is now the sticky sector. Sector one is much less sticky, but it's not flexible prices as in the previous analysis.
And here you see what's going on in the model. This is the impulse response of output to a spending shock normalized to 1% of GDP. In the left panel, that shock takes place in sector one. In the right panel, it's a shock taking place in sector two. Okay, now the blue line is the benchmark, the symmetric baseline case where you have a multiplier of 0.2. That's rather low and that is understood because monetary policy targets inflation, it basically gives you here the flex price allocation, the RBC multiplier, which is moderate, okay? So that's the benchmark. And then we can introduce our five facts progressively to see how they change the picture. You see, if you account for different pricing frictions in the two sectors, this matters big time. Now the multiplier is negative in, in response to a sector one shock, it's positive in response to a sector two shock, and it's much larger than in the baseline. And if we introduce all our features in the end, I don't go through everything here, I just tell you, in the end, the red line gives you the responses for the five facts model. It doesn't make a difference much for sector one shock effects, but it matters big time for sector two shocks. Yeah? Here now, the effect is much bigger. Why is that? Well, intuitively, it's simply because in sector two, there's more price stickiness and therefore raising spending there requires less of a counteracting response of monetary policy and so there's less crowding out bottom line there's no such thing as a fiscal shock it really depends on where it originates in this economy in terms of empirical performance let me stress one more thing here we can also look at the interest rate response to a sector two shock because sector two after all is the sector where most of the fiscal action is taking place if we look at this sector and we look how at how the interest rate responds to a shock here, we can compare our five facts model to the symmetric baseline case. And we see now a much more moderate response of the interest rate in response to the shock. And this is actually what we have in aggregate time series models. There's work by Monfort Ulig, my own work with Corsetti and Porto and Valerie Rainey. There's constantly this issue that interest rates are not very responsive to fiscal shocks. And this is precisely what our model predicts if you consider a sector two shock. Why is that? Sector two is relatively sticky. You don't need much of a monetary policy response. A little bit of monetary tightening is sufficient to stabilize inflation because most of the private spending happens in the relatively flex price sector. So a little bit of uh, reducing consumption is enough to keep inflation in check. Okay, let, let me skip this in the interest of time and show you a last graph here. A last graph here where we look at the effective lower bound. Yeah, that's the pink lines. And it's again the sector one shock and the sector two shock in the left and the right panel. And now you see that the ranking of multipliers flips. Yeah, in the left panel, you see the output response to the sector one shock, and it's now much larger. Also in the right panel, it's a bit larger. In both cases, the multiplier is now larger than one, but in particular, the sector one shock effect changes quite a bit because now at the zero lower bound, the impact on inflation is not met by a contractionary monetary response because arguably the central bank is finding the interest rate too high to begin with. So it's not raising interest rates in response to that higher stimulus. Yeah? So here we see uh, then a much, uh, much amplification in response to the shock. However, we don't see much amplification when it comes to sector two shock, yeah? it's just a tiny increase. And that again is consistent what we have in the data, at least if we uh, trust Remy and uh, Subari's uh, recent JPE piece, yeah? where they document not much of an increase in the multiplier at the ERB. Okay, so that's consistent once we look at uh, sector two shocks. Finally, let me conclude. Our anatomy of Big G delivers five facts about government spending. There's granularity, there's sectoral bias, there's only moderate persistence of government spending. It is the sectoral shocks, the idiosyncratic shocks, which drive the aggregate variation. And we find that government spending is concentrated in relatively sticky sectors. Accounting for those two facts in a two sector New Keynesian model, we find that in general interest rate responses are more moderate, there's less crowding out and the multiplier is larger. And so in a nutshell, if you want capturing for the micro facts helps the model to account for what we have in terms of macro evidence, time series evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Gernot.
then I would pass immediately the floor on to Henek for his discussion. Thanks a lot, Isabel. And uh, thanks for inviting me to discuss this paper. I hope you hear me well and see the slides by now. Um, now, that's a very nice paper. And uh, before I jump into it, let me make two disclaimers. First of all, I'm not relative to one of the authors of the paper, Michael, um, even though we share the, say, the same surname. Uh, so no hidden incentives here. And the second disclaimer, I'm uh, working in a policy institution, the Bundesbank, and uh, this is why I'm expressing my own views here. Now, um, this paper makes quite a few contribution and, uh, contributions, and it starts from the observation, which is quite a plausible one, that um, if you look at government spending, G, this, of course, is not one large transaction, but instead, uh, G is composed of many uh, smaller transactions. And uh, the authors make this visible uh, using this new database for the US, which has uh, all the, or a large share of the government procurement contracts. Uh, and from this database, they go and extract their five facts. Uh, I just uh, go over them briefly. First, government spending is concentrated in just a few firms or sectors. Uh, the sector composition differs uh, if you, depending on whether you look at the government or uh, the private sector. So that's what they call a bias. Um, there is moderate persistence of government spending at uh, all levels of uh, disaggregation, so the contract level, firm level, and the sector level. Um, the spending to just a few influential firms or sectors is going to dominate aggregate spending growth. And then uh, there's a statement about price stickiness, namely um, you get a concentration of government spending in uh, sectors with uh, relatively sticky nominal prices. Now, these are the facts. And then, um, as Gernot explained quite nicely, they set up a theory, a multi-sector New Keynesian model, uh, accounting for these facts. And um, I guess the, the main result there is that uh, once you account for these facts, you tend to get uh, larger aggregate fiscal multipliers. Um, so, I mean, as I said, this is a great paper. Uh, it, I found it quite exciting to read, and it's full of uh, a lot of interesting new facts and insights. And uh, if you're not happy uh, well, after reading the paper with what you got, then you still have an appendix of about 100 pages. And after reading this, you're certainly going to be happy. Okay, um, so this is a very rich paper. And um, I'm quite sure it's certainly not the last paper written with this newly available data, because this data is extremely rich and uh, very, very interesting. Now, I wanted to make uh, three comments. Uh, first of all, um, how about looking at even more dimensions of heterogeneity in the data? And I understand this is uh, a kind of a tough call. Uh, I mean, I, I told you about the appendix and uh, uh, it's probably a bit too much, but nevertheless, I think these are important dimensions and I at least wanted to point them out. Um, my second comment is about what we learn about the sectoral government spending process. And when I say sectoral, I also mean uh, the uh, cross-section of firms, right? So I, I refer to this interchangeably. Now, the third comment is about the in intensive versus uh, extensive margin of sectoral government spending. So let me jump into the first one, more dimensions of heterogeneity. Um, now, the data... Um, Gernot and his co-authors have, uh, they comprise both government consumption and investment, right? So consumption would be uh, purchases of intermediate goods and services, and investment is uh, uh, investment into structures, equipment, software, what have you. Um, now, we know that government consum that, that consumption and investment in the private sector behave quite differently also at the disaggregate level, right? So it would be really nice if you could show that your five facts also hold for consumption separately and investment separately. Um, now that's the first dimension. The second dimension, um, implied unit prices. Um, you show in your theory um, in a quite transparent way, as I think uh, that uh, the fiscal multiplier depends, so the aggregate fiscal multiplier depends on uh, relative prices between the two sectors in your theory. Uh, now, this raises the question whether you can say something about prices and relative prices using your data. And um, I was wondering whether you have information or could compute a contract implied unit prices 
um, because uh, those unit prices, uh, in case they exist, uh, they would be uh, very interesting to, to compare across different sectors. And uh, you could also compare them with the respective prices paid uh, by the private sector, right? And the respective, uh, in the respective uh, lake sector. Now that was the, the second dimension. The third dimension, um, now government spending is often uh, pre-announced. Uh, we know this, there's a big literature on this. And uh, if you uh, look at your big and sizable cross-section, uh, it's quite likely I find that the pre-announcement horizon is going to vary across these different sectors. Now, for example, think of an infrastructure project, uh, building a bridge, say, uh, you need quite a bit of time in order to pre prepare such a product, uh, pro project. Um, while if you acquire services, um, that, that is probably something that is much, much faster. Now, as another example, think of a sector in which uh, the average or median uh, value, uh, that the value of the average or median contract is either very small or very large, right? And for the large uh, value of the median contract, you would also expect that um, you need quite a bit of time in order to uh, pre-announce and, uh, and implement such a project. Now, the question of course is, is there such variation, cross-sectional variation in the pre-announcement horizon? And if so, can that uh, variation be exploited to learn more about fiscal shocks and their pre-announcement effects? Now, my second comment is about what we learn about the sectoral government spending process. Um, now, before the big cheat paper, life was simple, <laughs> at least when you thought about aggregate um, government spending shocks, it usually was an AR1 process. Um, and uh, once you specified it, you just needed to calibrate the mean, the G, the persistence, the rho, and the variation and the shock. And uh, that was about it. Now, with the big G paper, things uh, become more uh, comprehensive and uh, general, uh, and uh, you probably have to think of a multivariate spending process, right? Now, to illustrate this here, I put down a VAR, um, which uh, now makes G a vector which contains the cross-section of government spending across all those different sectors or firms, what have you. And then the VRR tells you how the cross-sections deviation from its mean, it's gonna evolve over time. And uh, all this is gonna be driven by the reduced form epsilon with the variance covariance matrix sigma. Now, it's pretty clear that this VAR is just illust illustrative um, and uh, it's clearly not parsimonious enough for the paper's large cross-sections. Remember, if they look at sectors, it's about a uh, thousand. If they look at firms, it's about 5,000, right? So you're not gonna capture this with, with the VAR, that's pretty clear. But in the theory, uh, that, that may be a bit different, right? Now, I think that the paper is extremely uh, explicit and detailed uh, about two objects of this process. And this is uh, the average value of the cross-section. Uh, that's what fact one and two are about, right? So the big concentration of government spending in just one sector, in, in just a few sectors, and the bias relative to the private economy. And uh, the other dimension uh, on which the paper is very explicit is the diagonal elements of the A1 matrix, right? Moderate persistence in government spending, um, irrespectively of the level that you look at. That's, that's fact three. Um, but there is more to, to this process. And I think there the paper is a little bit less detailed. Um, now, uh, one thing is the, the entire leg structure. Here I capture this illustratively by A1 and A2, which of course is informative about the uh, dynamic spillover effects between the sectors, right? Um, and then there's the variance covariance matrix, which of course is informative about contemporaneous spillovers between the sectors. Um, and of course, um, fact four of the paper is exactly about these things. Um, but I think uh, maybe the authors can do a bit more uh, along these lines. Um, and of course, the reason is that uh, these objects A and Sigma are gonna shape the dynamics of uh, the cross-section uh, in deviation from its mean. And again, the paper's theory suggests that these dynamics actually matter for the magnitude, but also for the time variation of the aggregate fiscal multiplier. So what, what could be done here? Um, of course, it would be nice to 
get a fairly parsimonious process in order to describe the big cross-section uh, G here. And maybe one way is to think about the influential sectors versus the fringe sector, so the essential ones versus the inessential ones. Um, then, of course, uh, explain a little bit or capture a little bit uh, spillovers uh, across these sectors. And uh, what I would actually find quite interesting is to think about uh, whether there are further variables, um, such as relative prices between the sectors, that are important to describe uh, the evolution of the cross-section G. Now, my last comment um, is about uh, intensive versus extensive margin of sectoral governance spending. Now, by intensive margin, I mean uh, changes in the value of ongoing contracts, right? Sometimes uh, these contracts are renegotiated or extended, and then the value is going to change. Um, now, the extensive margin uh, would be uh, new contracts uh, in a given period or, of course, uh, expiring contracts, right? Both of them would contribute to the extensive margin. And if I understand correctly what the paper at the moment does, it, it's going to pull uh, both margins, right? And considers them jointly. Now, to think more about this, let's, let's think about the evolution of the stock of government spending in a given sector, K. And for the moment, let's ignore the extensive, uh, sorry, the intensive margin, right? So changes in ongoing contracts, let's ignore those. Now then the stock of government spending is, is uh, today is going to be equal to the stock yesterday, plus um, what we get uh, in terms of the value of new contracts uh, today, minus the value of, new con of expiring contracts in the, period, in the previous period. Now this is just accounting, um, but now let's add an assumption, namely that contracts expire at a given rate one minus rho. And uh, then you get that the stock today is going to be a fraction of, of the stock yesterday plus the value of new contracts today. Um, now that's that's a fairly uh, simple equation, and you could uh, demean it. Uh, so consider the deviation of the stock from its unconditional mean, and then you see that what drives innovations in this deviation is going to be unexpected variation in the value of new contracts. Uh, and to me, this suggests that, that if you want to learn about these innovations uh, to the stock, then what you would uh, or could do is uh, look at the value of new contracts instead of looking at the value of all contracts. Now, um, I was wondering whether um, a specificity of the data, namely what the authors call the September seasonality, so. Uh, that's a seasonality uh, that arises because in September the, the fiscal year ends, and as a result, you get a big increase in the in the number and uh, I guess also in the value of new contracts. Now, I was wondering whether you could exploit the September seasonality in order to uh, disentangle a little bit more the, the extensive versus the intensive margin. Of course, there's a caveat, and this is that uh, uh, the seasonality is going to be uh, anticipated and. Um, uh, it's probably not uh, totally trivial to, to deal with this anticipation effect. Here's uh, a graph that Gernot also showed, uh, contract duration um, uh, in the data set. And you see that uh, the, the dashed line, again, that's uh, contracts with the duration of a year. Uh, you see that uh, a fairly, fairly large share of contracts is uh, shorter than a year. So I think this intensive versus extensive margin issue is, is really not such a big issue if you uh, think about annual frequency. But if you go to shorter frequency, for shorter frequencies, say a quarter or maybe even a month, um, then this issue I think is actually quite important. Now, I have um, just a few things to say, and these are only minor things to say about the theory, so, so I, I talk to Gernot about this directly, and uh, instead going to conclude. I think this is a very com complete paper on an extremely fundamental issue. And uh, for me, this paper works very well. So I'm by now happy to uh, throw overboard uh, the big G fiction. Uh, I think the paper raises uh, quite important follow-up questions, um, uh, which are quite multifaceted, I have to say. 
And uh, my big picture conclusion from this paper is it, it seems fair to replace the big G fiction by a big, big sector Gs, okay? And uh, once you do this, then this is gonna alter the transmission of fiscal shocks. So that's it from my side, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Henning, for this uh, very nice discussion. And actually, it's a great paper. I should have said that immediately after uh, the presentation also of Gernot. I mean, uh, also getting such a granularity into the data and, and it helps us much better to understand also how fiscal policy transmits to the economy. Gernot, I don't know how you want to do it, whether you want to respond directly to Henning. I saw in the chat there's already three questions that came in, mainly on, on the data, actually. So um, would you prefer to dis uh, respond okay. first to this question? Yeah. Or? Let me just thank you and, and Henning, I think that this will be brief because he raised a lot of points and he was very generous in his discussion. I mean, he casted this as follow up issues and I, I'm totally on board. I mean, we haven't looked at this really because we, we, we are struggling hard to um, to um, sort of organize our, our thinking uh, along those five facts, but there's clearly more to be done. I agree with this. So there is the um, the implied unit price, that it's a great idea. I think this will be very hard to tease this out and analyze it systematically, but uh, we could do more. And the same with the pre-announcement thing. Let me just say here, I mean, these contract durations, we know we observe the starting date of a contract and then the end date. And then of course you could also you take up the issue to what extent the action, the delivery differs from the uh, signing of the contract. So there's another anticipation period, but this is hard to tease out, but I, but I understand from a theory point of view, this would be very interesting to, to learn more here. On the multivariate VRs, I like these ideas. We, we haven't done this and you're right. I mean, we could look at various aggregates and then run some parsimonious VRs and see whether there are some spillovers, even though on impact, there seems to be very little spillovers, but it could take time for them to materialize. Totally agree. And the implicit and the, the intensive extensive marginal distinction is also a very um, useful idea. So I, I will talk to my co-authors about this, but uh, this is, yeah, this could put more structure on our um, analysis still. So thank you a lot, Henning. Very useful comments. You're welcome. So as I already indicated, Kenneth, there, there were three questions in the chat, mainly on the data. Um, I mean, just, uh, I'm sure you were busy with the presentation, so you haven't had a chance to, to look into the chat, but so one comes from Marco Bassetto. I mean, he's asking whether there's an issue about uh, the labeling of spending versus transfers. So I think he picked up on your presentation when you mentioned that healthcare spending is so small and he's asking, is it maybe because it's considered a transfer rather than direct spending? And then there's two questions from Jacopo Cimadomo. Um, one is on the, he's asking the amounts that are reported in the contracts don't necessarily one to one correspond to, to what you see in the, in the public accounts. Um, so he thinks some contracts may be interrupted or others are only executed partially. So he's asking, can you control for these effects? I was also wondering if you actually have information on these effects more generally. And then a uh, second question that Jacopo is asking is that you mentioned that 80% of spending is directed to the top 1% of firms, so the biggest. And, and so what is the share of firms operating in the defense sector among these firms? And uh, where is defense spending allocated when it's look when you're looking at it in the, in your slide 12 of your presentation? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thanks a lot for these questions. So, I mean, uh, first the transfer thing. So it's true. I mean, we we don't include transfer. So, I mean, yes or no labeling. I mean, we follow, I think, uh, standard practice in the sense that our G does not include transfers and our contract data does not include transfers. So. Um, we cannot speak to the issue. Now you could say that by changing transfers, the government is equally impacting the economy or in similar ways, but uh, we just don't have in that data, uh, we, don't, we, we don't have data on transfers. So that's a, that's a downside. On the other hand, uh, it, it, it uh, corresponds closely to, to what in the baseline model we look at when, when we do the big chief thing. Yeah. But I agree, this would be important uh, also to investigate. On Jacopo's thing, I mean, with the, what do we control for, for these disruptions? I mean, in the, in the database, there's this category modifications, and these modifications can be sizable and we do see them. Um, 
but uh, it's yeah con at a conceptual level to be honest it's not entirely clear you know across the entire universe of these contracts uh, what's the best way uh, to do with these modifications so in the end uh, um, we do um, not regard them uh, for the for the simple fact that you know this could mean different things some of the things uh, you um, you you mention uh, but yeah so I guess in the, the way we compute the facts I would say they are robust with respect to these modifications um, and we would get similar numbers irrespectively of, of, of whether we we, we uh, throw out this modification or we take them in but yeah so this is maybe uh, there's there's also more to be done here and try to understand better what the nature of these modifications is on the defense spending we have in the appendix of the paper uh, i don't know whether it's posted somewhere it's at least posted on our website uh, we do the entire statistics break up uh, for, uh, for separately for defense and non-defense spending and this type of granularity is is not driven by uh, defense spending in the sense that once we do this only for non-defense spending uh, the uh, uh, the share of um, well okay maybe yeah so the, 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 I have it here in front of me it's it's really between 75 and 80 percent also the share of the top one percent firms in overall spending if you only consider those contracts which are not department of defense contracts yeah so it's not that a few military firms uh, account for this this kind of concentration you also have very very similar patterns in the uh, non-defense spending part of the contract which is about half the data set somehow my videos i don't know what's going on yeah, we still hear you perfectly. At least I do. But uh, yeah, now you're back again. So you're you're coming and going. But uh, mm. it's it's good to see you once in a while, at least in there. Um, I'm checking if there's more questions from uh, either the panelists who can also raise their hands or from the audience. Um, I mean, meanwhile, maybe I ask a question myself. I mean, you know, you you presented in your model results. I mean, like how um, you know, you know, depending on to which sector kind of fiscal spending is directed, whether it's when there's the more sticky prices or not, that of course you would see different macro effects and then you, you attribute a lot of it to, to monetary policy. But of course we have a lot of models these days where you would say, you know, monetary policy is constrained by the effective lower bound. Um, how, how would that change our results anyway? Of course, in the reality, we have non-standard measures. So you may still say um, there are other tools to which monetary policy reaches the economy, but you know, in these models, very strictly, then say monetary policy does not react. Yeah, no, we we analyze a little bit the the ERB, and um, so since I mean, this is a new Keynesian model, and in the new Keynesian model, it's really the interaction of monetary and fiscal policy which determines the overall effect of fiscal policy, and that that's uh, really at the heart of our model, and it's really. This need for uh, monetary policy to counteract the stimulus, which differs depending on where the shock originates, and here the sector bias and the granularity are key. And um, so you're absolutely right. At the effective lower bound, things turn upside down because, as in the one sector model, we get larger multipliers in the flex price sector because here you want a lot of inflation coming out of the fiscal stimulus. And that lowers the real interest rate and that stimulates aggregate demand as in the standard model. However, in the other sector, yeah, where government spending is, uh, is more uh, pronounced, uh, you don't have that kind of an effect because their um, inflation is not very responsive in the first place. And so whether monetary policy responds to this or not does not matter so much in the end. We like that result to the extent that it conforms well with that uh, Remy uh, uh, Subari uh, paper, which documents that um, that at the effective lower bound multipliers do not increase that much, at least not as much as the one sector New Keynesian model, a la Christi Cristiano Eigenbaum Rebello would suggest. Yeah, so they, we don't see this in the data, and and we can explain this to the extent that we say. Yes, um, there's not much of a difference if we talk about the sticky sector anyway as the sector where spending is predominantly taking place. Thanks. 
I see no hands raised or additional questions, but I see Sabnam has uh, switched on her camera because uh, she rightly noticed that it's quarter past, uh, past four. So I would suggest we move to the second paper in this session.